Welcome to the 700 Club. Iran and its proxies continue to threaten revenge against Israel for the attack on its operatives. They're also hinting that the United States may also be a target. Israel is bracing for a retaliatory strike. At the same time, the IDF is warning citizens of conflict escalating on the northern border. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Khomeini vowed Israel would pay for the attack against its operatives. They will be slapped for that, of course. Day by day, the regime will become weaker, and God willing, it will get closer to demise and destruction. Iran's President Raisi and Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah hinted the U.S. also might be targeted. America is undoubtedly an inevitable partner in the crimes of the Zionist entity in Gaza. The enemy will be defeated as well as all who stand behind this enemy. Iran may view the upcoming Al-Quds Day as a time to retaliate. On the last Friday of Ramadan, Iranians chant death to Israel and demand the end of the so-called Israeli occupation of Palestine. Anticipating the threat, the IDF is increasing its air defenses and canceling vacations for all military pilots and calling up air defense troops for duty. As the country raises its defenses, it's also preparing to go on offense. Israeli media is reporting the IDF will launch a media campaign to prepare the civilian population for an escalation in the north. With the country on heightened alert, Benny Gantz is calling on his rival, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to agree to new elections in September, two years ahead of schedule. I believe that uh, the Israeli society needs to renew its contract with its leadership. Netanyahu's Likud party says an election would freeze Israel in its tracks as it wages war in Gaza and prepares to step up the fight against Hezbollah. You still have soldiers fighting inside Gaza with Hamas, and you also have a, a much larger war potentially looming with Hezbollah on the north. Uh, and if you go to an election right now, that could really paralyze uh, the ability of the politicians, including the prime minister, who would then be a, a caretaker prime minister with limited authority, uh, to be able to conduct the war the way it is truly necessary. As the Israeli government deals with the fallout after the accidental killing of seven international aid workers in Gaza, Netanyahu and President Biden are scheduled to speak by phone today. While Biden has expressed outrage over the deaths and opposes Israel's goals to invade Rafah and wipe out Hamas's last military battalions in Gaza, the White House insists it still backs Israel in its war against Hamas. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Just threats plus terror attacks in the Middle East and Russia have leaders worried it could happen here in the United States. Since 2020, more than 2 million people who are unaccounted for have crossed our southern border. And it's not just the ones on the terrorism watch list who are raising concerns. Gary Lane explains. The recent arrest of a Hezbollah bomb maker at the southern border and ISIS terrorists striking a Moscow nightclub have national security experts concerned the U.S. is also vulnerable. Jonathan Tobin of the Jewish News Syndicate believes Iranian proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, are targeting more than just Israel. America is a target, too, of Islamist terrorism. And until we have a government that takes this seriously, that takes border security seriously, we have good reason to worry that this could happen here. U.S. Customs and Border Protection have reported apprehending 70 illegal immigrants on the terrorism watch list since October. There are also concerns, however, about special interest aliens. Labeled as SIAs, these are individuals who may be considered suspicious based on their travel patterns, behavior, or country of origin. In the summer of 2023, the Daily Caller published data revealing Customs and Border Protection had flagged about 75,000 SIAs between October 2022 and August 2023. During a recent Senate Intelligence Committee hearing, Senator James Lankford asked FBI Director Christopher Wray about these special interest aliens. Is the FBI kept in contact from DHS and others who those individuals are or what kind of tracking and monitoring is on those individuals? I know that we work closely with DHS, especially CBP, on the issue of special interest aliens, including uh, a whole lot of work on the other side of the border to try to prevent them from coming in in the first place. 
and I know there are instances where we're contacted, but I, I'm not sure that I, as I sit here right now, I can tell you that we're contacted in every, in every instance. It's the criminal getaways, those in the country illegally and not monitored by the FBI and police, that worry many Americans. An illegal immigrant charged with the murder of nursing student Lakin Riley and the attack on New York City police officers by Venezuelan migrants are just two recent examples. Young Voices commentator and writer for The Spectator, Venezuelan-American Juan Pablo Villasmil, argues government agencies need to do more to keep SIA criminals out of the country. He believes some special interest aliens are members of a notorious Venezuelan gang. In New York City, NYPD has already determined that there is a presence of the trend de Aragua in the city. And as we see crime spread throughout the United States, many of them being brutal crime, a lot of people are asking themselves, how many members of the trend de Aragua are already inside the United States? While solutions to prevent criminals from entering the United States are under debate, Senator Marco Rubio doesn't believe the recently withdrawn border bill would have fixed the problem. He thinks presidential action would make a difference. The way you fix the problem is by reversing the executive orders that, that the President Biden put in place in his first month in office, which directly led to this crisis. An immigration crisis and national security threats that many Americans feel cannot wait until the next president and Congress take office. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, I think it was his first day in office where he made that change, and it was all based on campaign promises, and he campaigned on you know what, what Trump was doing in, in Attorney General Sessions and the separation of migrant children from their parents. And, and essentially, he put a, a sign up on the border, you know, you're welcome. And with that sign, who's reading that? Is it the poor and the oppressed? The answer quite clearly is yes, but our enemies are reading the same thing. And so if you have this policy where uh, we're not going to build walls and, and we're not going to keep you out, and if you get caught and you get arrested, well, what's going to happen? You're going to get released. Uh, that is a worldwide advertisement, and you, you have to look at what are the consequences for that. Well, the main consequence, and we're hearing from the mayors of Chicago and New York, is that our social systems are completely overwhelmed. You can't have two to three million people come across in this period of time and, and not have that problem. So that's number one. And number two, do we not recognize that we're called the great Satan? Do we not recognize that a lot of our current policies and social policies within a Muslim framework and a Muslim ideology are, are absolute reasons for them to attack us. Do we not get this? Do we not understand the lessons of 9-11 that it was immigrants who were allowed into the country from Saudi Arabia and they're the ones that went through our flight schools and we trained them how to fly airplanes? Do we not get the lessons of the history? And should we uh, demand that our government change these policies? Again, it's going to be a political issue. It's going to be one of the major political issues uh, for the upcoming presidential race. But in the meantime, let us not have a terrorist event. Can we please say no to this? And, and, and if you've got 75,000 people on some kind of su suspicious list, all it takes is one. Uh, that's all it takes. And, and should we not be vigilant who comes into the country should we not be vigilant that we don't have open borders? And if you're not going to enforce the immigration law, well, then why is the immigration law on the book? And if you want different immigration laws, I do point out to Democrats, you had full control of both houses and the executive branch for two years. And if nothing passed, well, it's your own fault. In 2018, the CBN News Channel launched in 15 television markets and major streaming platforms. Well, today, it's expanding to reach viewers in various markets across 26 states and Washington, D.C. The CBN News Channel provides unique coverage of daily events, cultural trends, and news with a focus on how God is at work in the world. CBN News. 
trans activists are challenging state bans on gender-affirming care. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs. Banking has become weaponized. Christian and conservative groups are labeled high risk. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Behind me is one of the many Iron Dome anti-missile systems. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope. Volunteers are helping families with their damaged home. Hallelujah! All in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel. The UN says more than a million people so far have escaped from the central and eastern parts of Ukraine. Discover the stories no one else is talking about. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. CBN News, because truth matters. Visit watchcbnnews.com to find where to watch. Well, joining me is the voice and face of CBN News, CBN News anchor John Jessup. So, John, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Today. You're on the show a lot, but usually out of Washington, D.C. It's such a treat to have you here. Thanks for inviting me up, Gordon. Okay, tell us about the CBN News Channel. Where can people watch it? Well, as for coverage, uh, of course, this is a consequential year, pivotal year. Uh, our coverage right now, we're streaming, of course, on smart devices. Uh, so you can get us on the CBN News Channel app. Uh, some of our programming is on the CBN Family app, the CBN News YouTube page, and of course, our website. Um, but the, the response that we've been getting lately is that uh, there's a tremendous interest in the coverage that we're providing uh, because of the times that we're in. So uh, our, 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 our ability to expand our reach and distribution is growing. Uh, right now, our CBN News Channel can now be seen in places as out far west as California and the Sacramento Valley. So this map is what I'll call traditional cable television? Correct, for the CBN News Channel. So we're out in the Sacramento Valley in California, Albuquerque. If you move out more east, you can see that we're in the Houston metropolitan area in Texas, Denver and its surrounding suburbs, Nashville, Atlanta, and as you mentioned earlier, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philly, New York City, and Boston along the eastern seaboard. We're not just in these major markets. We're also in many more markets with a potential reach of about 8 million cable subscribers. And what we're looking to do now is move into Florida. As you well know, Florida is a state that has been growing over the last several years, about 1,000 new residents a day. And it's the only state that one major cable provider said that their cable subscribership is actually growing. So that's what we're looking at now, trying to go where the viewers are. Okay. What if you're like me and you're a modern man of the 21st century and you've cut the cord? Mm -hmm. how, how can you watch? Uh, you can stream. We're on the CBN News app, uh, again, on the CBN Family app. What we're trying to do is make it easy. We're trying to lower the barriers of entry to allow people to find us, whether that's on YouTube. Um, I don't know. Where do you watch? Uh, I watch on the CBN News app on a smart TV, but yeah. I'll say it's also on my Apple TV okay. and it's also on my Amazon Fire. Yep. So I've got, I, I cover the waterfront, if you will, yep. and uh, I've got the app on all of them so I can tune anytime so I want we're to. We're trying to be wherever people are, whether it's, it's also on Roku. I don't yeah. have a Roku. But I don't have I, Roku. I know either, Roku is very popular. Yeah. So the goal is to be where people are. So even if we're not currently where your cable provider is, what you can do is call your cable provider and request that the CBN News Channel be added to the lineup. Yay. So, you mentioned before, I, I think people know it's an election year. Uh, if they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else is important this, this year that, that uh, needs this Christian perspective on the news? Sure. So every four years we hear politicians say this is the most consequential election year. Even if it's not, uh, it is a historic year. We have not seen a presidential rematch in almost 70 years. And you have two deeply unpopular candidates who are running with two deeply different visions for the country. Uh, and you have... Americans trying to decide which way, we go, which way do we want to go, but there is consensus around some of the top issues, whether that's immigration and the border that you talked about earlier, uh, whether it's about uh, finance and the economy, or another hot button issue, abortion. Uh, ever since the overturning of Roe, we have pending court cases that are about to be ruled on, and we have state ballot initiatives. Um, so that's going to animate voters as they head into the election cycle. Speaking of the election, I just want to give a quick plug. On November 5th, our entire news team will be working together to provide round-the-clock full coverage of the election results. Um, we'll, we'll use our teams, our resources. We'll stay up as late as we need to and as long as we need to on the air. 
care to make sure people have a credible source for trustworthy election news. Well, let's talk about something that's very close to my heart, which is our Israel coverage in the Jerusalem Bureau. So if I, if I watch on the CBN News Channel, how much coverage am I going to get uh, uh, on Israel? Well, right now, as of course, in the last six months with the war in Gaza and uh, Israel's response to fighting Hamas, it, it, it it takes up a lot of our coverage, uh, our team, and I just would love to uh, commend our team in Jerusalem with Chris Mitchell and Julie Stahl and all the others who've gone in to support them. Um, we're getting tremendous feedback on our coverage. People are telling us we can't find information like this anywhere else. Um, the information and the news and the stories that we're providing, the context that we're giving is so different from the rest of the media narrative out there. Uh, one of our viewers, and I wrote this down, mm -hmm. uh, wrote that he stumbled upon CBN, uh, CBN News after finding To Life, the CBN production, oh, wow. and he's been watching ever since. He says that we have a higher quality of news and more fairness. There's a guy named Mike who I think is probably a baseball fan in New York. He said that he's been hooked after watching six months and each time he watches, uh, it feels like there's a home run that we we've hit uh, so it takes it, it takes all the resources that we have to work together but the Jerusalem team has been working really hard and then we have programs like Jerusalem Dateline with Chris Mitchell that's a weekly program uh, that um, well, highlights all make it daily which I'd love I'd love to see sooner rather than later it's important it is important yeah. I mean, now more than ever it's it's important to have the uh, accurate israel coverage what 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 is the accurate news from the ground let's go back to if you're watching on traditional cable mm -hmm. how can you find out if your cable provider has cbn news channel there is a website you can go to you can go to watchcbnnews.com you can type in your zip code if your zip code isn't reflected what we're encouraging people to do is call their local cable provider and ask them hey can we please get the cbn news channel in our lineup yeah, that, would that, awesome. yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I actually did that this morning and found out that no, right here in Virginia Beach, it's not on local cable. So I think I, there's I was, some sway here. I was instructed to say, well, you know, okay, can you find it on Apple or, or uh, Amazon or Roku or on YouTube? So. All right. Again, we're trying to make it accessible wherever we can. Okay. If you, again, if you want to watch the CBN News Channel, it's real simple. To find out where you can watch, just go to the website, watchcbnnews.com. Type in your zip code. If the CBN News Channel isn't available in your area, viewers can call your local carrier, your local cable provider, request that they add it to their lineup. So, John, thank you for being with us, and we look forward to a very exciting year. Thank you. All thank right. you for your support. Terry, over to you. Nine stints in rehab, 14 arrests, five totaled cars. Brian was an addict who left a trail of destruction in his wake. For years, he was on a collision course with death itself, and then he saw it firsthand. The doctor gave me something for anxiety and depression, and I took that with the painkiller. I got behind the wheel going about 70 miles an hour and I blacked out at the wheel. When I woke up in county jail, the first thing I was thinking about is, I'm gonna be exposed. From outward appearances, Brian Astudo had it all. A loving family, successful business, a nice home and expensive cars. However, those things were just masking his insecurities and low self-esteem. I felt my self-worth on how much money I made knowing I made six figures and I had a Mercedes and I had a BMW and I had a big home, I felt like I was the man. As a young boy, Brian found happiness at church and even asked Jesus into his heart. However, church life was a social thing, not a spiritual pursuit. I was going to vacation Bible school. I was going to Bible studies. I was going to kids camps. I was going to everything that was there for me that was provided for me and I loved it. And I wasn't developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and it was more a do's and don'ts gospel identity. In his teens, Brian became obsessed with fitness and was soon getting attention from girls. I wasn't having sex, but I was having impure thoughts and sexual thoughts. At college, he gave in to those thoughts and started sleeping around. I wanted more attention. So the better in shape I got, the more girlfriends I had, the more sin I was in. I was caught in the cycle of sinning and repenting. 
sinning and repenting. I felt bad. During that time, his focus shifted from fitness to making money. He dropped out of college after two years and started working. I was always trying to find the next thing to buy or the next thing to do to make me feel happy. By his late 20s, Brian was the successful manager of a couple fast food restaurants. Despite his opulent lifestyle, he still felt empty. There were moments when I would be in a huge home, my wife and kids would be asleep, and I would think, is this it? Is this all that is in life? Then at 32, after three foot surgeries, Brian found something new to fill that gap, pain pills. The euphoria, the confidence, everything. It was all of it, everything. It made me feel great for that moment. I hid drugs, hid what I was doing and went about life just to cover up all of the pain, the insecurity, the self-esteem, the, the identity, all the problems that I had, I hid that and went about life. I hated myself and I wanted to do whatever I could to band-aid that with drugs to cover that, to enjoy something about me. It wasn't long before he went from functioning addict to junkie, shooting up cocaine and meth just to get by. After eight years of addiction, his wife demanded a divorce. Nine rehabs later, 14 arrests later, and five total vehicles, my wife kicked me out of the house, and I knew I wasn't gonna be around my kids anymore. And I remember the despair I was feeling. I wanted to numb the pain. I couldn't take the pain anymore. So Brian did what he always did and got high. However, this time, he took too much. And all I remember is traveling to the depths of hell. I couldn't scream and nobody could hear me. I could hear people. I could hear them scream, but they couldn't hear me. I started seeing all of the places that I would choose darkness over him. Instead of humbling myself, I was there because I denied his call over and over again. He pursued me and said, humble yourself, Brian. Humble yourself so I can help you. Surrender your life to me so I can get you help. I understood God's love and how just he was. And I had this hope in me. I cried out to him, give me one more chance and I will give you my life. I will surrender everything. And he said, I love you. When Brian woke up on the bathroom floor, he rededicated his life to God and soon checked into the LA Dream Center rehab. It taught me what life needs to look like when you're putting God first. In his two years in the program, Brian says God delivered him from addiction. He also learned true joy comes through pursuing God, not material things. He and his wife Stephanie reconciled, and a few months after he finished the program, they remarried. Today, Brian travels the country sharing his testimony about God's love and grace when there seems to be no hope. Not only did he take me out of the depths of hell with his grace and mercy, he made me understand why he chose me, why he loves me. After I humbled myself, I understood what kind of God he was, what kind of loving God he was, what kind of just God he was. A lot of us think that God is against us when we do wrong. And I want to remind you that he loves you and he wants you to humble yourself so you can get the help that you need. Now, there is inherently in us, I think, a sense that um, that our life needs to matter, that there is something that we need to be or do, that somehow there is purpose, but we can't find it. And so we do what Brian did. You know, we just keep climbing up one mountain after another just to get to the top of the mountain and find there's nothing there. And you do ask yourself, no matter how big your house is or how many cars you have or how many titles there are after your name, is this all there is? You see, we are created with purpose. We are created with intention. 
but it's not for things. It's not for something that we can just drum up in our hearts or minds. It's for relationship with the one who created us. You know, to do that, to have that, you have to acknowledge that there is a creator who created us. You're not just here by chance. You know, you, you're not just some embryo that, that was born into this world without, without any direction, without any focus. It's there for the taking. And you can do things that when you're young, you know, Brian did it all right. I mean, he, he was going to church. He was going to youth group. He was studying the Bible. He was doing all of those things, but he missed out on the point of all of that. It's not the activity of it. It's the relationship with your creator. And until we find that, all the stuff that we do, all the things we pursue are just meaningless. And so we come to those places in our lives where we say, I've, I've, I've done it all. You know, what? nobody signs up to get hooked on meth or cocaine. But it's what happens when we begin to let other things satisfy us. We think we're finding happiness. We think they're filling that emptiness and that loneliness inside. And they're leading us down a dark, dark path. In Brian's situation, the mercy of God took him to a place where he could see the choices he was making and what was happening. And he made a decision. You see, that's the great news of, of the life that God has given us. We get to choose things. We're not animals. We're not plants. We're people. We get to choose things. We have a brain. We have a heart. We have a mind. Today, I just want to say to you, if you are feeling that kind of emptiness that Brian was feeling, you know, sometimes you can think you've been a Christian for a long time, but it's just not, it's just not there. It's not filling that need that you have. If you are feeling empty inside and far away from God, guess who moved? It's not him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay there. He's calling you to a deeper place. You were created with a purpose from him, by him, for him. Wouldn't you like to know what that is? He's not keeping it secret. We get to come to him and say, God, I'm giving you my life back. I'm saying you've given it to me. Now I'm turning it back to you. And when we talk about surrendering our lives to Jesus, we're talking about not climbing those mountains of our own making anymore, not seeking after all that stuff that we think is going to make us happy and leaves us so empty and discontented. We're saying, God, I recognize you created it all. And remarkably, miraculously, I'm part of that. Now help me live my life the way you intended me to live it. That's the surrender. Not my way anymore, but his way because it's the way that leads to eternity. And that's the big gift. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in and have fellowship with him. Not just here and now, but forever. We are in a very short journey here leading to an eternity that was especially prepared for us. Don't miss that. It starts by inviting Jesus Christ into your heart, saying, I recognize I am a sinner. I need a Savior. And Jesus, that price you paid was for me. And today I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul, to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can hear your voice, so my heart will obediently respond to you. That's the answer. That's what's at the top of the only mountain that matters. It's surrender. It's choosing, it's obedience to the one who loves you more than you can imagine. Listen, pray that prayer today because it will open the door to heaven for you here and down the road. Pray it now. If you need someone to pray with you, go to our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. And if you're struggling with drugs, ask for the resource sheet. Breaking Free from Drugs will send it to you totally free. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. We begin in Taiwan, where rescue workers continue to pull people from the rubble of Wednesday's earthquake. 
In the city of Waleen, the quake damaged 48 buildings, including this one, a mixture of homes and shops. Several floors collapsed after shaking, toppled the building off its foundation. Rescue workers freed 24 people from the wreckage. Some of them are now taking temporary shelter in tents. More than 600 people are stranded in a hotel while workers repair damaged roads. About 100 others are missing or trapped in other areas. At least 10 people have died in the tragedy so far. In Baltimore, Christian clergy are ministering to crew members who are still on the ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Last week, the cargo ship Dolly lost propulsion and hit a support, causing the bridge's collapse. As workers labor to clear the wreckage from the ship, the crew are still on board carrying out their duties. Catholic and Episcopal priests who minister to ship workers who come through the port are in contact with the crew of the Dolly, making sure their spiritual and physical needs are being met and assuring them they will be on hand when they're able to leave the ship. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Well, David was born with a hernia. When he was three years old, that hernia swelled to 10 times its normal size. It gave David a high fever, which caused him to have seizures. Well, that's when his mother became worried that he was going to die. Three-year-old David was born with an inguinal hernia. His mom, Davy, grew alarmed when she saw that the lump had grown 10 times its normal size. It was so big. I thought, why does my son have to suffer like this? David's hernia and associated pain kept him from running and playing with his cousins and friends. Davy says at first there was just one lump. Then there were two. He cried a lot because it was really painful. I remember one time he cried more than usual because of the pain. And he had a high fever for almost two weeks. He even had a seizure. I was really afraid that he would die. Davy's family is poor. Her husband only earns about $3 a day. According to David's dad, Atang, getting surgery to repair the double hernia was out of reach. Deep in my heart, I wanted to provide surgery for my son, but it was impossible. One day, a relative whose daughter had received free surgery through Operation Blessing connected the family with us. We then paid for David to receive a free operation to repair the hernias. Now David can run and play with other kids without pain. We want to thank Operation Blessing for helping our son David to fix his hernia. I can't imagine what my son's life would be like if we had not met the people from Operation Blessing. I hope you can help others like you help us. Thank you so much to all of the people who gave to support us. Thank you. That thank you goes from Indonesia. There's a Muslim family in Indonesia thanking you because you cared enough to give. When we provide help for people, we don't have a religious test. The, the te only test is, are you in need? And can we show you help and concern? Can we show the love of God for you? We love you. God loves you. We want to do that very tangibly and help you in your time of need. If you want to do that, if you're not a member of the 700 Club and you want to be a part of this, it's real simple. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some can join higher levels. We have them. 700 Club Gold is $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. And you're a part of everything we're doing around the world. Whether it's surgeries through Operation Blessing, a portion of every gift goes to Operation Blessing. Another portion goes to CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. You're a part of all of it when you join. Now, when you call and join at any level, we've got something for you. It's How to Believe for Healing. It's a wonderful teaching where we lay down the principles well, how do you find healing in the Bible? What are those scriptures? What do you stand on? What should you be believing as you pray? 
Uh, there's uh, about an hour and a half of, of teachings. Then Ashley and I get together in the studio. We show testimonies of other people that have been healed, and then we pray for you. Then there's a workbook where you can study the scriptures on your own, make notes. I want you to have this. It's called How to Believe for Healing. It's yours when you join. And Terry, you've got some viewer reaction. Well, we're getting such a great reaction to this. This is uh, Linda, who lives in North Chesterfield, Virginia. She says, the testimonies were very effective and important to hear. They added faith to our lives, very scriptural. Keep up the good work. And then Dan, who lives in Palm Har Harbor, Florida, said, this is the best workbook I've ever read on divine healing. I feel like I'm back in first grade learning the biblical basics of healing. I started studying it as soon as I opened it. Thank you. Then we have James from Cleveland, Georgia, who said, I'm convinced this is a divine endeavor and a ray of God's light into this world. God's love is surely the motivation for this teaching. And to him be all the glory. I thank him for this ministry. So people are really touched by the teaching. It's all biblical. And who doesn't want to know what the Bible has to say about healing? Curtis Parks was a musical prodigy who wanted to be a rock star. For years, he chased the dream. Then, when it was right at his fingertips, he turned it down. I just wanted to be adored. I want to be a rock star. I'm writing songs to be famous. In 2004, Curtis Parks could see his dream coming true. He just passed the audition for American Idol and was on his way to Hollywood. I was like, okay, this could, this could actually be the big break. This could be the moment. Curtis grew up as a preacher's kid in the small mountain town of Salem, Virginia. He showed a talent for music at an early age, a talent his parents encouraged him to pursue. His father was convinced God had given him this gift for a reason. He said, look, we're going to start a church. I don't know where or when, but when we do, you're going to be our worship leader. His dad was right. By the time he was 15, three years after giving his life to Christ at a church summer camp, Curtis was leading worship at his dad's church. It put him in the spotlight, and he liked it. Early on, when, I, when those accolades and that praise came, it was all absorbed. It was all like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty awesome, right? By the time Curtis left for college at Virginia Tech, his dreams had far outgrown the walls of the church. He saw his future filled with recording contracts and concert halls filled with adoring fans. He formed a band at school and they were a hit around campus, playing in clubs and at parties. They even opened for national acts like Sanctus Real and Howie Day. Anytime I could be on a stage, uh, I just loved that moment. Meanwhile, he continued leading worship in church. I would call myself a Christian. I didn't pray much. I was just going to church and going through the motions. Then in 2004, Curtis auditioned for season four of American Idol punched his ticket into the first round of competition. Although he made it to the top 50, Curtis was eliminated. I thought this was it. You know, I was so devastated. I'm 21. So I thought my life was over. Back home, it was his dad's encouragement that fueled the young man's desire to keep going. And he said, hey, if this isn't what God has for you, just imagine what he has. And I think he was probably referring to worship and and that but in my mind I'm thinking all right well I'm, I'm gonna get famous some other way so Curtis recorded his first album and in 2005 he signed with a small record label having recently married Curtis moved himself and his new bride Sarah to Nashville because I'm still really selfish I'm still going after fame I'm still this is all I want in life then came reality Curtis was on the road constantly performing and promoting his album. The weeks rolled into years. While Curtis would have some success, his dream of stardom always seemed just out of reach. But you just keep justifying, hey, it's gonna happen one day, and that one day just doesn't come. In 2007, tragedy struck the Virginia Tech campus. And in the wake of the shootings, students and the community turned to one of their own to write a song to help process the pain and grief. It was Curtis. With questions on our minds, we wonder where the future lies. So we look up to heaven. We were getting hundreds of emails a day from students 
saying this song is what's getting us through this season. Finally, Curtis started to see what his father had been saying all along. I had no idea that a song could do this for people. And maybe this is why God gave me the gift of songwriting. In 2008, Curtis was invited to another well-known television program, America's Got Talent. He admits at first he was tempted. This is the turning point of my life. I was like, oh my gosh, this is everything I've ever wanted. But God was doing something in my heart. I listened to that still small voice that warned me against going down that path to fame and stardom. I said, all right, God, let's try it your way. Several days later, Curtis fell to his knees in prayer. And I'm just over and over again, just saying, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Weeping, just knowing that I had been chasing, making my name known. And it finally dawned on me that God gave me the gift of music to make his name known. Everything started to make sense. The peace I experienced in that moment, realizing I didn't have to strive anymore. Curtis is now a worship leader and songwriter bringing glory to God. And I am not I was, was All of us are given a purpose that until we walk in that purpose, life is gonna seem really futile, like an endless pursuit. So when you surrender to God, then you find peace, then you find joy. That seems to be the theme today, doesn't it? We're all born with purpose. We need to find it. It's in Him. It's in Him. And when we find that, we find all that we're looking for. Listen, if you're one of those people struggling to find out what your purpose is, what God's created you for, we want to offer you this resource, your identity in Christ. What does the Word have to say about who you are? It's yours for free when you call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just ask for the resource, your identity in Christ, and we'll send it to you for free right away. We have a little bit of time left for your email questions. Gordon, this first one comes from Carol, who says, I am a French Canadian, and I'd like to know about the 12 tribes of Israel. Was Israel able to find all the descendants of every tribe, and are the descendants living in Israel today? Where can I read about this? Uh, Carol, it's a great question, but there's a reason we call them the 10 lost tribes, the lost tribe tribes of Israel. Various uh, historical writings have tried to say, well, here's one of them, or here, here's where they went, and uh, we're descended from one of the lost tribes, and, and none of that has ever really um, uh, held up. Look back in, in the, the biblical history, when the two kingdoms split, there was a northern kingdom of the ten tribes, the southern kingdom was Judah, and within Judah there was the, the tribe of Judah, and the Levites, and so the tribe of Levi. And those were the two tribes that survived uh, the Assyrian invasion of, of northern Israel, and they took them away captive, and they, frankly, have been lost to history. Occasionally you hear about, you know, well, we've discovered uh, Jews in China, the Jesuits wrote about that, and, you know, the Kaifeng, and then, you know, um, roots of communities in India, Ethiopia, Africa. Uh, there, there have been various ones, and, and are they from the lost tribes, or are they from Judah? And all of that has been lost in history. Uh, there is a worldwide call uh, for the Jews to come back, and they call it Aliyah, uh, where they return to Israel, return to the land. Uh, the people and the language being restored, all of these wonderful things. Uh, there's no definitive history on any of it, and you can, you can kind of um, scratch your head, you know, what happened? Will there be a restoration of all things? That's the promise of, of Scripture, so we look forward to that. But keep this one thing in mind. The reason they're called Jews is because they're descended from the tribe of Judah. Uh, that's where the name comes from. Well, here's a word from Psalm 16. You will show me the path of life in your presence of the, is fullness of joy at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. 